We are the product of our personal experiences. Perhaps that's why we look back on our past with fondness. Even if you're like Gary Larkin, whose days of youth were a bit on the wild side in the outskirts of Sydney, Australia. I mean, very different time. Um, you know, I was, a, I was a child of the late 50s and 60s and uh, growing up in Australia, which was um, still, I guess, awakening at that point in time. The, what we call the Great Australian Bush was my backyard. You know, we grew up in a in an environment where pretty much everything you saw would kill you. Um, so you, you, you learn to be aware of your surroundings pretty quickly. But it was a, it was a wonderful childhood. You know, it was, um, it was a different time. Uh, one of those things, I think we all look back on our childhood and wish we could give it to our children. But, but I truly do believe I was blessed and, you know, had the gift of, um, of, um, of good luck on birth that you just can't buy. Gary moved to the U.S. in the 1980s to help launch Foster's Beer. Australian for beer. Yeah, really. He's been here ever since, helping some iconic brands and even television shows achieve relevance here in the States. In my early careers, I was involved in, in um, a wide range of, of uh, film, entertainment, radio, TV, and, and subsequently um, put together a, uh, a, a global marketing company that was specialized in sport and entertainment. And uh, we had uh, many Australian clients for whom we would operate both internally, but we were lucky enough to get the contract to help uh, what was then Carlton United Breweries launch Fosters globally. So we, we actually had the global launch through uh, UK, Europe, uh, Canada, and then into the US. But um, I was um, I was addressing our other business with my partner in the US at the time. He was um, uh, engaged to an American and he had intended to take up root here. And I can recall clearly him calling one day and asking if I could uh, get on a plane and come up and help him for a couple of weeks. He said, uh, you know, we, we really need some assistance here. This, this launch is getting a bit beyond us. And uh, I can remember packing for two weeks 37 years ago and have never lived in the country since. Gary's background includes everything from radio, television, and live events, production and marketing, to graphic arts and advertising. That might be a far cry from where Gary is today, but those experiences helped shape his perspective as an innovator. I think the through line really is the business fundamentals apply. It really doesn't matter what you're applying it to. You have to remember that you know the, 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 what's important to business is at the end of the day, more money coming in the front door than going out the back, delivering a service that people like and come back and use more of as often as possible. And if you apply that, that critical thing thinking to whatever field you're, you're endeavoring to move through, you'll find your footing fairly quickly. Solutioning through industry problems, looking for the, you know, the bottlenecks, what are the points of abrasion, trying to think it backward from a customer experience perspective. And I think that kind of uh, thought process of always starting with the customer, who's, who's using this, what do they want? out of this. Not what do I want to give them, but what might they find valuable from what I'm trying to push forward um, is, a, is a really consistent thing. This is the Ready Tesco podcast brought to you by Applause. I'm David Cardi. Today's guest is Aussie expat and chief strategy officer of Marker Tracks and Coin Mobile, Gary Larkin. With decades of experience in leadership positions across various payment solution companies, Gary Larkin has learned what works in innovation and what doesn't. Gary helps companies successfully execute on their innovative visions in the expanding but highly regulated casino gaming industry. Innovative minds can dream up some big, grand ideas, but they need to be grounded. Let's find out from Gary how to approach that. Now, Gary, it's one thing to have a great idea for a product that will revolutionize an industry, and it's another thing to have it launched successfully in the real world. So, what are some of the key criteria to executing on a product vision? Look, I, I think the first thing is be prepared to fail fast. You know, first and foremost, you really have to find out if the dog's going to eat the dog food. Um, it doesn't matter how good for the dog it is. If the dog's not going to eat the dog food, it's not going to sell. Um, and you need to do that with the consumers. Again, back to the consumers. Take it to the coalface. Find out. You know, does I have a great idea, but does everybody else think it's a great idea? And even if they think it's a great idea, will they adopt? Um, you, you, you can be 
easily drawn into sitting in a vacuum and talking to yourself when you're doing products development and, and trying to uh, revolutionize or, 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 or bring new products to market. Um, it's very important, I think, to get a proof of concept out into people's hands quickly at the risk of being told it doesn't work. Um, you know, right. and, and do that early enough to pivot, come back, learn from that and, and keep iterating on that product thought and design. Um, don't get too hung up in, in the technicalities. Don't, don't let perfection be the enemy of good, um, I think is the important part of how to bring something into market um, and, and to be measured in where you release it. Don't get over your skis. Put it everywhere. Try to do it in a measured fashion, so you do have the opportunity to adjust in the product design and development and packaging before it gets into a fully open market environment. Now, it can be difficult to have a detailed grasp of how the customer is going to use the product, the customer journey, when you're developing an innovative product. What are some of the ways that you can help get an understanding early on into how the customer will eventually use that product in their journey? Look, I think it's it, it's really rather dependent on the type of product and the and the end consumer. You know, clearly, getting to the typical target end consumer quickly for input is important. But uh, most products have you know interlocking circles of target customers. You know that that center of the bullseye doesn't always jump out at you, and sometimes your your product's going to fit a little better for the for the for the customer profile you didn't anticipate. So you. You, you've got to be open to this. Um, I think it is important to check yourself and make sure you're not putting your thumb on the scale. Um, really, really be careful and try to be as clinical about how you allow the customers to come to your product as possible. If you're there helping them, that's not a true experience. Find ways to remote yourself and look in at what's happening. Get outside the paradigm and, and look back in and learn from that and, and really, really listen. And again, at, at the risk of learning what you didn't want to hear, uh, better to know early, fail fast, and, and, and then learn and regroup and move on. And as part of that, there's always going to be a little bit of a trade-off between speed and depth of product, right? Having a really feature-rich product and having one that gets to market fast. So uh, what is the balance The balance between a minimum viable product that really, really hits on one or two great things and a more expansive, full-featured product? You know, I know there are, there are exceptions that, that you know, don't prove this rule, but in my experience, the simpler the product is, if you're moving a market, if you're trying to get a consumer to adopt a different behavior, buy a different product, shop at a different store, don't look for, for the ultimate solution out the gate. Iterate them, move them forward gradually, bring new products, new things in behind it, build on the basis of the relationship you formed with that customer. Far too often I have seen, I have been guilty of this myself in, in my career, in over-engineering uh, products, putting all the bells and whistles in and, and not realizing in the process, I'm confusing my customer, that, that the true value proposition is getting buried in a lot of glitter and it's not resonating with them and, and needs to be stripped back to a more naked version of itself in order to, 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 to find that, that earlier adoption. So I... There isn't a one size fits all. I, I, there's no, regrettably, no panacea. I, I think it takes a lot of thoughtful minds to solution a, a, a product's vision into a marketplace sustainably. And then the other part of that is always how do I repeat this? How do I keep doing it? Um, and, and have I built a product that is robust and fault tolerant and scalable and able to, to, to meet the supply chain needs and keep coming out to market day after day? And this is an especially important idea if you're creating a product for the common consumer, the, the meat and potatoes type of user, right? right? So how can you develop a successful product that really connects with a broad consumer base that might not care about all the flashy bells and whistles, all the glitter, as you say, behind the product? Well, I think there has to be a common thread of need or at least value. Um, be, get clear on your value proposition. Really understand what you're doing for the consumer. That can sometimes be a little confused and muddied in, in products that 
get delivered through a supply chain, retailers, or as we are in the gaming industry, we deliver a solution to a, to a player through the casino who has a set of requirements, uh, beliefs, and, 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 and sometimes limitations. So working through that supply chain, understanding how to nuance that towards the end goal, not letting your mission and your message get hijacked by the distribution channel. And that can happen very, very quickly. Um, so keeping close what you're doing and giving value to the supply chain, but not giving your product away in the process. Careful dance, um, you know, and, uh, and sometimes you don't know you've lost it till you look back and realize you just gave it all away to the, um, to the channel. Um, so keep an eye on how the product's going to be delivered um, over time and make sure you factor that in, in how you develop, you know, packaging, messaging, um, customer support's a big part of this. You, you know, these pieces are important if you want to own your product. If you're, yeah, while it seems sometimes easy to default that away to the channel, when you do that, you also default the relationship of the customer to the channel. In, in speaking to that relationship to the customer, they care first and foremost that the thing works, right? So, yeah. so how important is digital quality along this innovation journey, especially when it comes time to put a product in the actual hands of the consumer? Look, I think it's very important. I, I think in today's market that with, with um, incredible media clutter, with incredible um, competition for um, – front of mind awareness for for time, screen time, just simply getting people to want to click your app, use your whatever. You know, there's there's a lot going on there. It's it's incredibly important to to ensure you have solutioned the smoothest possible customer onboarding experience to your product. Um, is it easy for them to use? They don't want to think. None of us do. Um, you know, we, we want to think about the things we like, but we want all the stuff that we get to just work when we get our iPhone out of the box. And I think that's the great example. You know, we all want the iPhone equivalent product. And I think it's the great, it's somewhat of a gold standard. Get that. Lots of things to fold about iPhone, but by and large, consumers know they get an iPhone, pull it out of the box, plug it in. It's going to work. And, and, it, and that's what they've come to rely upon. I think looking for that as our gold standard, making sure whatever you do, no matter how little, and often it's less than you want, but no matter how little you do, do it well. Make it faultless. Let the customer know they can rely upon it to work persistently over time. They'll come back. Yeah. And, and I definitely co-sign on, on that idea, by the way, of... I don't want to think, especially at the end of a work day, the kids have exhausted me. Last thing that I want to do when I'm, you know, finally have time to myself is to think about the product that, I, that I'm working with there. So uh, I co-sign on that. Uh, speaking to that digital quality uh, concern, is there a little bit of a push and pull and a balance there too, especially when you're talking about innovation efforts, you know, can it be difficult to establish that success criteria in a way that doesn't interfere with the innovative uh, goal there? Well, look, I, I think uh, you, you've said it earlier. It's, it's a give and take. Um, you know, if you have enough value in what you're doing, a consumer will put up with a little bit of pain, um, but they'll move quicker and stay longer for convenience than they will for cost. You know, most people tend to focus on I can be cheaper, um, tends to fall down the list of what motivates people to, to stay with something or move to something else. Um, we'll all say it's the cost, but it's the convenience. Um, and, and so if there's a lot of value, which isn't necessarily monetary, but if there's a lot of value for the consumer's participation with your products or services, they'll put up a little pain. Um, but again, you want to be careful how big a, an audience you give that pain to. Uh, I think it is about trying not to keep making it painful as you as you iterate your product. Try to work a lot of this out. Now, today's marketplace is arguably more global than ever before. What's the key to success as you expand your product, both in terms of functionality and expanding it into new markets? Well, look, I think you have to understand your lane. Um, and I did a lot of uh, export development in my earlier careers for the Australian government, Swedish government, Norwegian uh, governments, bringing tech products and other products into specifically the US market uh, or other global markets. Um, while the world is global, 
and the opportunities are vast. I think you have to understand your niche, your segment. Um, it may not be every geography, or it may be every geography, but a much more limited niche within those geographies. Understand who you're selling to and what real potential you have to move into those global distribution channels. And is it valuable? Um, yeah, do, you, you know, do you chase every shining bauble or do you focus on what's what's near and able to be mastered? Be careful not to overreach because many companies have failed with growth. You know, they're, the expansion has overrun them and they've collapsed. Um, don't get beyond what you can sensibly support and control to keep integrity in your product and make sure your, your resources, and often if it's a new technology, the resources are limited. Even if your budget isn't, the, 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 the technical skills, the domain expertise that's needed to build, support, and nurture your product's delivery are often not in abundance. So they can be overrun pretty quickly and, uh, and good people can be buried in a, in a, in a, in a sea of uh, technical debt trying to catch up. Right. You know, it's, it's a great point. And, and to your point, you know, it has to be a viable fit in a new market, right? If you're, if local regulations prohibit what you're doing online gaming, for example, it yeah. really doesn't matter how well it works. It doesn't matter what the innovative vision is. It's simply not going to work. But even beyond that, there are many considerations when it comes to localization, the culture of the users in that market, for example. So is there anything that you can do at the planning stages of a new market launch to really help reduce that risk that you're taking on with expansion? Well, again, I, you, you do need to spend a little time with the consumers. I recall in, um, in the early days of taking um, high-risk credit products into Mexico for, uh, for Cash America then, as, I, as it was, we were trying to emulate products we'd successfully launched here in the US, presuming a somewhat similar adoption given the demand for credit. Um, we, and I can remember staffing up for the, uh, for the large employment uh, opportunities. We go out to large industrial complexes and we'd, we'd try to get uh, employees to sign up to the program. Um, and it was fairly typical at that point in time for financial service companies, banks particularly, to have great looking gals in short skirts go out and try <laughs> to promote their products. Um, and so we followed. We thought that was a good thing to do. Um, and we had a lot of attention and large crowds and nobody signed up or very few signed up. Um, and what we realized is that they liked to look at the girls, but they felt intimidated by them. So they wouldn't come over and sit down and sign up. No problem. We decided we'd put guys in suits and make them look more like a man. Nobody signed up. Um, and we eventually discovered that we needed a much friendlier maternal kind of look and feel. And we hired housewives. And, and suddenly adoption was immediate um, and uh, because they didn't feel threatened and they felt like they could interact. So I think understand that culture. What is that culture? Don't project your thoughts, your cultural experiences into that new market. Uh, and that's true even within a geography like the U.S. I mean, it's often overlooked that the U.S. is, is 50 states and they're not all the same. And, and yeah, a, a big mistake that's made by a lot of people coming into the U.S. They just say, well, it's 330 million people and, you know, I'm doing so well in this market of 20 million people. This is going to be fantastic. And then they it fails miserably because they don't understand the complexities and the geographies and the, the socioeconomic differences as you move across even states, let alone from state to state. Yeah, it's it's funny how a, a conversion or a purchase can sometimes com just come down to a gut feeling. It, it's always uh, kind of interesting yeah. to think and, about and that. Don't, and don't over and don't overlook that. I mean, believe me, yep. you at some point every visionary has back their gut. Steve Jobs against all odds, right? You know, and and to, uh, now there are many many stories of people who have done that and failed, but. But at the end of the day, somebody's got to make a call. And that's the other part of it. Don't, don't overthink it either. Um, you know, it's uh, analysis to paralysis sometimes. You do need to move, learn going forward, um, not sitting in the workshop, um, you know, trying to make it perfect. You do need to, to put it on the street, generally for two reasons. One, you don't get any revenue till you do. And that's an important ultimate uh, event. But also you learn more out there than you'll ever learn in the uh, in the boardrooms or the uh, or the huddles.
Right. The real feedback. Absolutely. Yeah. You have a rich background in payment solutions in particular. This is a challenging industry right now between global expansion, different forms of centralized and decentralized payments taking hold. There's really a lot to be mindful of there, right? So how can brands innovate in this space in a thoughtful but substantive sort of way? Uh, look, I think that much of what we do in payments today is – is um, it harkens back to the early days of Bank America morphing into Visa. It, it, it's, it's about trusted relationships. The, the, the very essence of our global banking system relies upon good faith relationships between banks and governments that at the end of the day, if you tell me you will pay, you will pay um, and that the money was there. Uh, we've put controls on that. We've, we've, we've layered um, anti-money laundering and Bank Secrecy Act and, and OFAC screening and all of these things to make elements of the financial transactions uh, safer or, or more secure for governments. But at the end of the day, underlying that, you have this core need for trusted services. Um, so if you're going to get into the financial services sector, I would say first and foremost, plan to be a trusted partner. First and foremost, remember that everybody operates with a sense that they're at some risk. So respect that. Um, and while it may move slowly, uh, and it does, as does gaming innovation, um, it does for a reason. There is a lot of risk associated with the transactions that take place when they get to scale. And, and typically things don't start going wrong until you get to scale. Uh, the frauds don't happen until you have visibility by which time uh, you better be buttoned up. Um, so how to innovate? I'd say firstly, understand the entire landscape. You're dealing with banks uh, at the end of the day. Crypto has proven to be the unreliable new kid on the block who one day is great, and the next day is falling apart. And, um, it'll, in my opinion, uh, my humble opinion, will ultimately find its footing when it when it adopts reg regulation, and I think it'll get there, and I think banks will move towards blockchain as the underlying technology to drive future financial transactions. We're seeing a lot more of that already. Um, but um, you, you need to look at who's there. What are you really trying to do and what's out there? First and foremost, if, if it exists, don't build it. A lot of people run off and they start building technologies, believing they're going to invent the better mousetrap. This is, this is a tightly regulated environment. There are a lot of huge players in there. I prefer to look to how to leverage what they do around a, a, a niche opportunity that we add value to in some way, which, in, which quite frankly is what we've done with, with Coin um, for the gaming industry as a mobile wallet, what we've done with Market Tracks. Neither of those two products essentially are any different to things that go on every day of the week all over the world in financial services. They just haven't happened inside the gaming floor. And, and what we had to do was to identify what, what existed that we could lever. How did we build a, a channel, a, a create a connectivity between it and the gaming floor? What had to be regulated and make sure we don't over-regulate ourselves? And, and then we solutioned back from that. And we're still learning, it was a long process. We, you know, it, I remember the day when we began it three and a half years ago with Market Track. We thought, how hard can this be? We just blocked the cash. Um, three and a half years later, we laugh about that. You know, it could be really hard. <laughs> um, but it's born an incredibly successful business in an industry that is burgeoning in, in, in the U.S. market, burgeoning in the global markets. Um, and we find ourselves in high demand. A um, lot to do uh, going forward. But... But um, much of what we talked about earlier here today, we tried to apply, um, been guilty at times of forgetting it and, and losing our way and then having to come back to center. But, um, you know, we had the luxury of um, some outstanding patents that protected some uniqueness of what we did and gave us a little latitude to be wrong once in a while and still come back from that. Um, not all opportunities bring that with them. Uh, we've been blessed with that. Gary, our, our world is more extensible all the time, our digital world. All of these APIs, they need to connect, they need to speak with each other, they rely on each other. And you see this in your line of work as well, right? Cashless Absolutely. products need to synergize, they need to come together, they need to create a better experience for the gamer in your case. 
So this question is going to depend on the openness of the particular industry, but how important is extensibility and even partnerships between different products when it comes to that end user's experience? Look, in in industries as mature or those siloed historically as the gaming industry, partnerships are essential. Our product couldn't exist if we weren't first able to form a partnership with one of the leading system manufacturers in the gaming industry. Konami was our our first partner. I give them credit. They've been great. Uh, Having that and and a test bed uh, with a uh, with a founder's property to to, to play with as we learn, um, you know, would the dog eat the dog food? Will they come back? What does it take? Gave us the chance. But beyond that, the need to constantly partner with with evolving parts of this of this marketplace. We found over time by staying open to the prospects that competitors aren't enemies, they just have a different product they're selling and maybe one day we'll do that together, has allowed us over the three and a half years to come back and partner with people who would have initially thought us to be complete rivals. Um, and, and, and we continue to do that and are open to doing that. Um, and thankfully they are too. Uh, we have to add value. You've got to be clear, um, ensure that the, the business partnerships you forge have value for each of them. Um, and uh, uh, it's a big industry. Unfortunately, we're, we're able to, to coexist. But yeah, partnerships are essential both in the industry and outside the industry, because in our case, we're bringing traditional financial services, banks, processors, payments aggregators into this environment through relationships we forged and uh, intermediary technology we control. We're partnered with um, uh, a large global entity, Euronet, who's who's been a phenomenal partner to us strategically, uh, technologically. We've been able to bring a lot of what they do into our products to improve them, make them uh, more robust, more scalable, more fault tolerant, more more able to run alongside the the uh, the growth we're finding inside our business, um, and that's the other reason I think to constantly think about partnerships, what it takes to be a startup, what it takes to be an early stage company, and what it takes to be a productized enterprise class deliverer of financial services, completely different things, and and at each point along the way, knowing when to to transition into that next uh, uh, architecture. It really is. And it's not just the tech, it's the company. You need to be mindful that the, often what you start out with as a competency set has to be morphed over time to meet a growing business opportunity or you'll stifle your own growth. Uh, you know, so the, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's the great challenge of business. It's the thing I love about business and, and and it's, it's the constant through line in whatever business you are in, whatever industry you have been in, anywhere in the world. Uh, and so if you can get those fundamentals locked in early and you bring that to the table each time you embark on a new adventure, um, ultimately you'll find them paying off over time. Okay, Gary, final sprint questions here. In one sentence, what does digital quality mean to you? digital quality mean to me? Um, I think it's delivering a seamless experience to an end consumer, whoever that is, that satisfies their need and, and, and persistently satisfies their need. That's perfect. What will digital experiences look like five years from now? Oh my God. I wish I could, I wish I could imagine a different, Different, completely <laughs> different. Um, I mean, I think of a world that that much of what we rely upon today won't exist in, um, where you know la- laptops, P- um, iPhones are moving away. We don't have them. Uh, it's it. And then what does that mean when we decouple? You know, at what point do we? I mean, I I think of the discussions that are, that are looming around singularity. Um, you know awesome and frightening topic. Uh, you know, uh, I think the thing that's going to change us most in all industries is, is what probably is most frightening, and that's AI. What, what yeah. AI will do to every industry, what it, will, what it will allow us to do that we've never thought of doing, the power it will give to our innovation. 
um, is going to so greatly change the shape, I think, of, of, of our daily lives in the next five years. I'm excited to see it. I'm a little scared as to what it might do because I've seen some, as we all have, we've seen some great downsides of some of the technology uh, uh, revolutions over the last you know, 15, 20 years. It hasn't all been good. We haven't mastered our technologies well um, to, our, to our end goals, but uh, hopefully we'll do better as it continues to evolve. Gary, what is your favorite app to use in your downtime? My favorite app to use, I, I'm going to admit to this, my wife, to my wife's chagrin, and that is, I, I, I'm a TikToker. I, I, yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, I play, uh, I, I play a few minor games. I like to keep my mind active, but I'm, I'm a little concerned that I, I overstimulate. You know, I'm, I'm a bit guilty of constantly reaching out for the phone. But yeah, I, uh, I love that instant gratification, that eye candy that that TikTok gives you with. Um, little, little bits of what's going on in life, um, but I'm I'm a news guy too, you know. So I I, I I like to get on the news feeds and catch up with what's going on around the world. And Gary, what is something that you are hopeful for? What am I hopeful for? Um, I mean, in 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 a business sense or in a general sense. I mean, in a business sense. Um, I'm hopeful that we find greater harmony with the technologies that we're making available to ourselves. I truly am. I think there's a tremendous potential to have great outcome. Uh, I don't think we're doing it well enough today. I think we'll, we can do it better. So I'm hopeful for that. Um, and on, a, on a more general note, I'm hopeful that we can step back away from some of the vitriol we've been able to inject into our culture over the last five or 10 years. I, I think we, we use uh, the screen of, um, of social media to vocalize things we would never say to somebody's face. And, 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 and that kind of bullying or, or um, just bad behavior, uh, I'm hopeful we'll find its way out of our culture. That was Gary Larkin, Chief Strategy Officer of Marketrax and CoinMobile. Thank you for tuning in. And if you haven't already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button to see or hear future episodes. Shout out to our producers, Joe Stella and Sam Susala, and graphic designer Carly Searles. Feel free to reach out to us at podcasts at applause.com. That's plural, podcasts at applause.com. We'll catch you on the next episode.